Okay, Dr. White, do you believe that Christ having one will is a heresy? Yes. Do you believe that Christ having two wills is orthodox? Yes. Could you show us in Scripture where you know that to be true? That comes from the fact that uh, as the Council of Chalcedon itself taught, the Scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is both God and man, that He is one person with two distinct yet whole natures. And the Council of Chalcedon was perfectly biblical in teaching that because it recognized that the will arises uh, from those natures. And therefore, all the passages of Scripture that refer to, for example, the Lord Jesus in, the, in uh, Paul's writings, as they crucified the Lord of glory. Here is an indication of the fact that Christ is one person with two natures, uh, that the crucifixion is, is a part that was done to his physical nature, and yet he is called the Lord of glory in regards to his divinity. So I firmly believe the Chalcedonian definition is biblical in its foundation, and therefore monothelitism is an error because it, in essence, undercuts that and results in someone saying that Jesus' human nature uh, was not fully human. He was not truly a, a man, and he was not truly united with us, and therefore the entire concept of the atonement uh, is threatened, and that is, in point of fact, uh, what was uh, so troubling to many of those who encountered that particular belief in the days of uh, uh, Honorius and Sergius and, and thereafter. Okay, let me pursue this with you a little bit. Um, I couldn't help but notice that you referred, first of all, to the Council of Chalcedon, but you don't believe that they were infallible, do you? No, I certainly do not. I do not believe that any council is infallible. I believe that a council's authority is always subordinate to the sources from which they derive their beliefs. Okay, so then what the Council of Chalcedon said could be an error, is that yes, correct? Yes, it could be, unless okay. it is in line with Scripture. For example, the seventh or the second Nicene Council, uh, which I believe is uh, numbered the seventh ecumenical, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, was very much in error in promoting the concept of uh, the adoration and veneration of images. And you can see this by examining their alleged biblical argumentation. In that case, their biblical argumentation on an exegetical level is, is, is utterly fallacious. Okay, so you really have no reason to refer to the Council of Chalcedon because you don't know that they were infallible. Uh, no, I, that wouldn't be true, sir, because as a person who honors the fact that God has been building his church for 2,000 years, I am not one of those who believes you, you ignore uh, those who came before us. I honor the memory of those who came before me. I just simply do not invest them with the element of infallibility any more than I would look at uh, someone like a Calvin or a Warfield or someone else and say, well, unless I believe they're infallible, that I'm going to ignore everything that they had to say. Well, I'm not saying you have to ignore them, but uh, you, you said to me that you believed that two natures was orthodox, and, or I'm sorry, two wills was, orth was orthodox, and one will was not orthodox. Right. Uh, you really have no way of knowing that from the Council of Chalcedon was my point. All you can do is reference them and say that uh, they believe this thing or that thing. Now, going on, uh, you refer to scriptures that talk about the two natures of Christ. Could you cite that scripture for me? Uh, that was uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, as I recall, off the top of my head, the passage that I was referring to. Uh, if they had uh, known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, off the top of my head, as I recall, that was uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, yes, 1 Corinthians 2.8. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And in the work that I've done, the doctrine of the Trinity over the years, and dealing with oneness Pentecostals, uh, this passage and some others, for example, possibly Acts 20:28, 20, uh, have been some of the key passages that are used to uh, point out the fact that Christ is uh, one person, a unified person, that he's not two people like uh, many in the oneness movement present, uh, that has uh, two natures, hypostatic union, uh, all those other things that come along with that. I'm familiar with all those terminologies. Uh, what I would ask you to do is show us in 1 Corinthians 2 8 where it teaches that Christ has two natures. Well, again, uh, if you're asking for explicit creedal statements or if you're asking for the revelation of God in Scripture, and uh, any creedal statement's authority comes from the accuracy with which it reflects God's words. And so any creedal statement, whether it's an answer to a specific question that we derive and put into the form of the language of the question, 
its authority comes from how true it is to the scriptural passage. So I am not saying to you that 1 Corinthians 2.8 specifically addresses the issue of two natures. It teaches that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And when we think about who Jesus Christ is in the context of Paul's teaching, we know that the Lord of glory is a, a reference to his deity, and yet crucifixion is something that one does to a man. And therefore, to distill that revelation into an answer to a question is what theology is all about. Okay, well, I submit that I don't see that teaching there. I think you're in making an implication that it's there because of other ideas that you have. And if that's the strongest verse you have, I'm having difficulty in seeing how that supports two natures. But the issue here is actually not really two natures, but the two wills. As you know, in the uh, formula of the Sixth Council, it said that uh, two wills came from a source. Okay, so it's different than two natures. Uh, could you explain to us then, uh, because you said you believe that Christ had two wills, not one will, where the teaching of two wills is in Scripture as opposed to just two natures? Well, again, it is an implication that is drawn from biblical facts. The biblical facts are that to be a person requires a will. A human being who does not have a will is not a person. And so to say that Jesus Christ was uh, one person with two natures, and yet those natures are not full, would be to say that Jesus was, for example, a semi-God, but not truly God, or to say that he was semi-man, but not truly man. And this was the problem uh, that was seen in that day. And again, I uh, would not uh, invest any type of authority in a formulation outside of its faithfulness to its underlying biblical foundation. Okay, so I gather you don't have a scripture that points out that Christ had two wills, you are getting there by using your logic. And I would submit this to you, that uh, the Sibelians did the same thing. They used logic when they were trying to define the Trinity, and the modalists did the same thing too. They said, how can God be one and three at the same time? That's an impossibility. And yet the church held that even though it sounds impossible, it is indeed true. So what I'm asking you this, what I'm asking you is, uh, you seem to be using logic to arrive at your decision rather than using some scripture that tells you that Christ had two wills. Uh, do you find that contradictory? I read the Bible and I do not read it irrationally. Uh, I allow it to speak for itself. I allow it to speak as a whole. I believe that scripture is theonustos, which means that every word speaks with the authority of God. And that is why we can do systematic theology is because what Paul writes to Timothy and what Isaiah wrote in his revelation are not contradictory to one another. And so when you say that the Sibelians and the, and the modalists and uh, Arians and anybody else quote unquote used logic, uh, what you're seemingly saying is that we're not to use logic in listening to what scripture says. Uh, I believe that since God is the God of truth, you listen to all that he says and you do not interpret him in such ways to make him contradictory to himself. That is the glory and the wonder of Scripture, is that when you allow it to speak for itself, it does speak with one voice. And in responding to the Sibelians and the modalists, they did not use logic on every passage because they misinterpret passages in such a way as to make the authors contradictory to themselves. Uh, I find it interesting that you grilled me on the issue of the two wills, and you said for 40 years no one knew whether that was true or not, so what's a person to do? And yet I'm asking you for one scripture that talks about two wills, and you haven't given me one yet. And yet you claim that scripture is your final authority. You, you went to 2 Timothy 3.16, and you said it's uh, profitable for, it's theopneustos, it's, uh, it's the ultimate that you go to for any controversy at all. And yet you still haven't given me a scripture saying that Christ has two wills. You've given me a lot of verbiage. Uh, that says we should do this, we should do that, we must think this way, we must think that way. But the, the point, in fact, is uh, I'm going to ask you again, uh, if someone's salvation depends on a doctrine of, of this sort, as you implied, uh, and he can't find it explicitly in Scripture, what is a person to do, Mr. White? Well, Mr. Sanders, you, you just made a number of statements uh, as a part of a very long question, and you said that I grilled you for, for uh, quite some time on that period. You're the one making the assertion that there is an infallible authority that we must embrace in the Bishop of Rome, and it has been my assertion that that very assertion itself is ahistorical, and I believe many scholars agree with me on that point. And so it is not my assertion that uh, the situation with Honorius historically in his own day uh, demonstrated that Honorius was a rebel against what had come before. The problem is that it is your assertion that they believed in papal infallibility in that day, that they had these criteria, and the simple fact of the matter is they did not. 
And so if you're attempting to contrast the claim of Rome that the Bishop of Rome is an infallible authority when teaching ex cathedra with the clarity and the perspicuity of scripture in regards to many issues that the Bishop of Rome teaches on today, I personally don't see any parallel between the two at all. And I see nothing wrong in my challenging you to attempt to prove to us from history rather than just assuming it that these individuals believed these things and my saying that all those individuals in that day did believe that what we have in Holy Scripture today was God breathed and that it did contain the fullness of the gospel. Okay, uh, you said that I'm making the assertion. Uh, I did back it up for you because I, I went right to the writings of Agatho, Pope Leo II, the emperor of the period and the Sixth Council and they all said the same thing that the Pope Ag Agatho spoke infallibly on this issue and was against Honorius. Now, the question is for can you. I, is that a question? Or do no, that's not a question. It's not a question. This is the question. Uh, on the other hand, you said I was making an assertion. You were making the assertion that Scripture gives you the answers for your faith. And I'm asking you again, show us a scripture that says that Christ has two wills. It's again, I have never made the assertion that the phrase Christ has two wills is in scripture. I have said that that is a logical and proper conclusion from the biblical evidence itself. And even more important than that is the fact that those individuals that you are citing, you, you quote Agatho, uh, here is someone who in his teaching never taught the things that you as a Roman Catholic today would teach is necessary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, such as the bodily assumption of Mary. And this is the, the entire point here, is that what we're supposed to be discussing is, did Honorius teach in such a way as to violate the doctrine of papal infallibility, and how do we know? Uh, it is an interesting question to ask uh, whether we should uh, have a debate on the issue of the natures of Christ on the basis of biblical evidence, and I suppose we could have a debate to discuss that. I'm not sure anybody would show up for it, but I suppose we could do that, but I don't think that it's relevant to this particular issue at all.